I'll pass it off to uh, my coworker, Hannah. Hello, everybody. I'm Hannah. I work here also at the Scotts Hill Water Conservation District as a resource conservation technician. Um, <clears throat> Megan and I are kind of the technical staff here for the Lawns and Legumes program, so I'll let Megan introduce herself quick. Hi, I'm Megan Darley. I'm the Natural Resource Conservationist um, at SWCD, and just like Hannah said, we are your technical experts in the county to help you implement some pollinator habitat, and then we will also introduce Dr. Elaine Evans. Perfect. Alrighty, so I will jump in. Um, and let's see. Oh, um, there we go. Okay. So we have Dr. Evans on today. So first off, we will have an overview with Dr. Evans about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee ID. Um, then we'll have questions. If you have any questions pertaining to the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, um, make sure to ask them um, after the presentation as Dr. Evans may not be on at the end of the presentation. Then lastly, we'll just kind of go over the program for Lance Leggings through the district. Um, but let me introduce Dr. Evans here. So Dr. Evans holds a PhD in entomology and works as an associate extension professor at the University of Minnesota Bee Lab in the Department of Entomology. They handle questions related to bee conservation and are currently monitoring the population of the endangered rusty patch bumblebee. So Dr. Evans, thank you again so much for being here and I'll kind of pass the reins off to you. Um, if you wanna share your screen, we should be able to see the presentation then. All right. Perfect. Let's see if I can manage this. All right, I assume you all are seeing the, the slides. Yes, all we right. are, that's perfect. All right, great. Um, a little bit of just information about, um, about bumblebees. So um, some bumblebee species seem to be doing fine, but there are about one out of three bumblebee species that we're concerned about them being in decline. So I'm going to talk a lot about rusty patch bumblebee, but there are um, other bumblebees we have um, out of our 24 bumblebee species that we have here in Minnesota, we're concerned about at least five of them. So, um, so generally um, paying attention to bumblebees is really helpful. And there's all kinds of things that are, that are happening that are stressors for bumblebees and other pollinators. So things like climate change, pesticides, there's diseases and parasites. You'll notice in the middle here is habitat loss. So that's a lot of what the Lawns to Legumes program is addressing is getting more habitat on the landscape to, to help bumblebees and other pollinators. And you can see all these things are, are interacting. That habitat piece is really at the center. And so um, for habitat, there's, for bumblebees, there's really three different, different um, types of habitat needs that they have. So the first is nesting habitat. The second is, is, is flowers to feed on, and the third is overwintering habitat. So for nesting habitat, bumblebees, the rusty patch bumblebee in particular is pretty variable in where they're nesting. A lot of times they're in an old rodent nest. Um, it's oftentimes just a cavity with some kind of insulating stuff in there. Um, so just being aware of that, keeping your eye out for that, generally having kind of undisturbed corners in your yard can help um, make nesting habitat available for them. Flowers, there's all kinds of different flowers that they need, but they're getting all of their food from flowers. So flowers are really important. That third habitat piece is overwintering habitat. So for winter, the queens dig themselves down into the ground. We don't have a ton of information about um, what they're doing, but in general, leaving leaves um, in the fall um, through, through the early spring provides some, some insulation and may make some, some habitat for them to, um, to go into. Um, just, you know, emphasizing we're going to talk about, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with habitat, but um, we need to deal with these other stressors too. So climate change is, is really important, doing what we can to, to lead to a stable climate future. When you're creating 
bumblebee habitat um, or pollinator habitat to keep it free of pesticides, including um, insecticides and fungicides and herbicides. Um, and also being aware of kind of the, the what's happening around where the bees are. So managed bees can be, so either honeybees or there also are managed bumblebees can be a source of some of those diseases and pathogens that we're concerned about as a stressor. So making sure that, um, that managed bees are being managed to reduce diseases and that there's enough flowers to support um, all the different kinds of bees. And then um, we really do need your help, both um, with documenting rare bees as well as creating those kinds of habitats. So I'm going to go over some, some bumblebee ID stuff, and there is going to be a little quizzing kind of section. So first off, just telling bumblebees apart from, from other things that want to look like bumblebees. Because um, bumblebees and other bees have a, a sting that protects them, there are other insects that try to look like bumblebees, even though they don't have stings, as a, as a way to try to trick predators. So um, one of these, there's some flies that are amazing bumblebee lookalikes. The thing to, to check for them is um, to they, they will... Um, have a little bit broader connection between the, their, their sections. Their antennae, um, bumblebees have these long elbowed antennae and um, flies a lot of times just have these little feathery things. They won't be carrying pollen on their legs and, um, and their mouth parts will be really short. Also their behavior, flies tend to kind of hover and kind of jump around a little more while as bumblebees, when they're in the flower, they're really getting in there. Um, clear wing moths. Um, these are, are beautiful insects um, that, that um, also can look like bumblebees, but, um, but they have a really different overall shape. They have these really long curled tongues that they're using to get in there. There also are some other bees that can look like bumblebees. We don't have a lot of these, these carpenter bees in Minnesota, um, but there are a few that have been showing up in recent years. Um, I don't know if they're actually established here or they're just kind of randomly appearing sometimes. But these have, they're about the same size as a bumblebee, but their abdomen will be really shiny. So um, bumblebees tend to be all covered with hair. These guys can be kind of shiny. Um, Andrina are another one that they're out in the early spring. They tend to be smaller than bumblebees. And also when they're collecting hair on their, on their legs, it is in these um, hairs. So, so bumblebees, they, they actually have an indentation on their back leg, it's a pollen basket. And when you see pollen on their legs, it's kind of a big brown shiny ball. And these will be kind of, kind of fuzzy looking so looking at um, identifying rusty patch bumblebee, um, and uh, you know, to do that, you have to kind of tell it apart from other kinds of bumblebees. The main thing we use are the color patterns, but one thing to, to be aware of is that they're not always reliable. So um, this bumblebee ID is, is simpler than, it, than, than species level ideas for a lot of other bees, but it still can be pretty tricky. So for the rusty patch bumblebee, if you're looking for these bees in your yards, which, um, which we hope you do look for them on flowers, anywhere, um, anywhere they might, you, you might have flowers in the summertime, you could have a chance of seeing these. So there are a few main things to look at. So firstly, on the thorax, there is this black T-shape. So between the bases of their wings, there'll be black that goes between there. And then there'll be a line of black that, that goes back towards their abdomen from there. The second thing is what they get their name from, this rusty patch. So the rustiness of it really varies. The color of that varies. Sometimes it looks kind of just dull brown, sometimes it's bright orange. Lighting can make a big difference for whether you see that or not. Um, but um, on bumblebees, they have um, six different segments. And for the um, rusty patch bumblebee, that first segment of their abdomen is entirely yellow. 
And then on the second segment, it's just at the top of it, they have is where that rusty patch is. There'll be yellow on the sides of that second segment and yellow at the back of that segment. And then the rest of that segment is, is black. And so the there's both females and males that will be out foraging in the summer. And the males are really similar. Um, they have the, the same color pattern. So here are a couple of pictures. Um, you can, can see here, this the rusty patch looks really pretty dark. Um, you know, they also hold their wings over it, so it can be hard to see. But here you can see this the the black between on the on the thorax, that kind of um, T shape. So for telling the rusty patch bumblebee, the, I'm going to just go over some of the main culprits that people mix them up with. The first is the half black bumblebee, and this bumblebee has it doesn't have the the T shape between the, the, the wings on the thorax. It just has kind of a black spot in the middle. And um, segments, both segments two and three are yellow and the rest is black. So you, when you see something like this, it's super easy to, to tell the difference because you don't see the rusty patch. But um, when you're looking at, the, at them in reality, you can see here, this can look kind of darker on the side here. And that's just because when the hairs are thinner, Sometimes you're seeing through to their black exoskeleton that they have, and that can make it look darker. So sometimes um, on that second abdominal segment with the half black bumblebee, it can look darker. You can think that there might be a rusty patch there. Another bee that does have rusty color on it is the red belted bumblebee. And um, these, they, they have the black hairs between the wings. It tends to be kind of, um, a little bear between uh, um, in the kind of middle there. They don't have that T sh that the little thumbtack shape coming back. And these, um, when it's talking about bumblebee color patterns being variable, this red red belted bumblebee has a ton of different color patterns. So some of them don't have any red. Some of them have have black. Um, but if you do see another bee that has you know red or rusty color on it, if it is the red belted bumblebee that the red color will be kind of from the back section of segment two and it'll be present on other segments there. So here you can see um, looking, this is segment one and segment two, you know, it has this red color, but if it was a rusty patch, it'd just be kind of a rusty patch there. And then the rest of this would be black. For um, Bombus impatiens, um, the common eastern bumblebee from its common name, you can tell this is a very common bee. So this is actually, um, especially in late summer, um, almost all of the bees that you'll see will likely be common eastern bumblebees. And they, um, they just have that first segment of the abdomen is yellow, and then the rest is black. So um, they do have a little bit of this kind of a, a tear shape coming back, but they don't, it's not, it's more kind of a bald tear spot. It's not black hairs making a T shape. That second segment is all black, unlike on the rusty patch bumblebee where that would, that would be where the rusty patch was. And um, just to note that, that also bees are out living in the world and sometimes they're out there for a while and they can lose their hair too. So, so this is um, a common Eastern bumblebee. This is supposed to be all yellow here up on the thorax, but sometimes they, they lose their hair. And this is what I was talking about with the pollen baskets. So they can have these big globs of pollen on their back legs. So that will be these shiny pollen balls. The two spotted bumblebee, this is the, probably the most common one earlier in the summer. And this one does have some yellow on the second segment, but um, the rest, the back part of that second segment will be black. It doesn't have the T-shape. And um, this one on the second segment has this W shape that's um, kind of in the middle of that, that second segment. And that's the, the, those are the two spots, are these two spots on the second segment. Sometimes they can have a lot of extra yellow that goes, goes through here, but, um, but they're very common. There's um, a sideways and a little bit blurry view of, um, of the two-spotted bumblebee. There you can really see that, that W shape on the second segment. 
So there is another bee that, uh, that happens later in the season. This is a cuckoo bumblebee, um, the lemon cuckoo bumblebee. So these, these bumblebees don't make nests on their own, but they go into other bumblebee nests and take them over. And the males can look a bit like rusty patch bumblebees. They've got the, this T shape on the thorax, but it tends to be kind of broader. Um, they have all the first three segments are all yellow. So you know, they, they don't have the rusty patch, but they also have more yellow. Um, and they can be pretty common, especially in the, in the late summer. And um, here you can see how this, this yellow hair can look really different depending on kind of the, the angle of the photo um, and how the light is hitting it. So going over just quickly, these kind of common um, this commonly mistaken with rusty patch bumblebees. Here's the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, this is the brown belted bee, which I think somehow we, I, that, sorry, that got left out of the slideshow. So um, that one has yellow on the first segment. That second segment, it does have this rusty brown, but the thing that's really different here is it's rusty brown and then black right away whereas on the rusty patch it has that, that yellow underneath it. And again, no, no um, black T-shape on the thorax. So this one with all of that extra red is the red belted bumblebee. This is a bee that um, was probably not gonna be very common um, in, in Scott County, but if you go further north, so if any of you have a cabin up north or you regularly travel up north, this is um, a really common bee up north. Um, and so this one does have the T-shape on the thorax. It does have some red, but, um, but it has a, a lot more of, of this kind of orange um, rusty color. So um, this one, um, just keep an eye out for it if you, if you go up north um, to, to not confuse it. So this one here is the, the half black, really similar except for missing the, the rusty patch. This one is the lemon cuckoo bee. Then we have the common Eastern and the two spotted. So um, I'm just gonna do a, a quick kind of um, quiz here for you to just, um, you can just um, do this on, on your own <laughs> thinking in your head, or if you want to, you can put stuff into the, into the chat for, for who you think this is. So we've got the choices here, and here's the, here's the picture. So we've got someone saying two spotted. And um, this, a couple for two spotted, and this is indeed a two spotted bumblebee with the, the two spots on the thorax there. And um, how about this one? So this one has some nice big pollen baskets. Just has one segment of yellow and then the rest is black. Someone saying common Eastern. And this is the common Easter egg. So the main thing with them is they have this, this one yellow segment and the rest is black about this one. So two things to look at here. What's going on on the thorax? What's going on on segment two of the abdomen? So this is a rusty patch. So this is a nice clear picture where we can see this, this rusty patch and there's yellow on the other side of it, on the back edge of that second abdominal segment. We've got the black hairs kind of coming back in this T-shape. All right, so, um, so just, uh, just in case you're feeling super confident now, um, I'm gonna give you one more confusing piece of, of information. Um, and that is that um, this is also a rusty patch bumblebee. Um, it doesn't have the, the black T-shape on the thorax and it doesn't have a rusty patch. And that's because um, queen bumblebees of the rusty patch bumblebee do not have a rusty patch. So, um, they actually have those first two segments are all yellow. The queens, you're really only gonna see them in the early spring. 
And then in late summer, early fall, um, they're, they're a lot bigger. So this the color pattern here looks like that half black bumblebee. Um, but these, if you see a rusty patch bumblebee queen, they're going to be a lot bigger than, than those are. They're, they're really um, plump and fuzzy. Um, so they also, if you look them straight on at their, at their head, they have this short face. And, um, you know, we really do want to document where the, where the queens are too. They're just a little bit tricky because you just need to be aware of, um, of them not having a rusty patch. I wanted to mention a couple of um, programs that we have for helping us to keep track of, of bees and helping the scientific community know about rusty patch bumblebees and other bees. So um, at the University of Minnesota, and we're, we're doing this program cooperative with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. So we have a bumblebee atlas, which is statewide, and we have volunteers um, adopt grid cells, so 10 by 10 kilometer um, grid cells that are all across the state of Minnesota. And, um, and we have training materials there. You do need to, to commit some time to going out and doing a couple of surveys in your grid cell every summer. Um, but you can get more information at minnesotabumblebeeatlas.umn.edu. Pretty soon we're gonna be opening things up for people to adopt survey grids. We also encourage people to take photos of bumblebees and share them on iNaturalist. So at iNaturalist, you can have as an app on your phone, or you can take pictures and share them through their website. From um, We still need to pick the dates for 2022, but usually kind of the last week of August, of, of July, I mean, we do this backyard bumblebee count where we're trying to really get people out taking as many pictures of, as they can of, of bumblebees and sharing them. The idea is this is usually when rusty patch bumblebees are a bit more common. So we're, we're hoping to, to focus in and really um, see, see if we can find them so we can know where they are to help them. A note on um, taking photos for, for um, iNaturalist or for anything where you're sharing photos. You can see from, from what we looked at that it helps to see a few different angles of the bees to get ID. So it's, it's best if you can try to get at least three pictures of any bumblebee that you're sharing for identification. So getting a picture from the, from the top down so we can see the abdomen, getting a picture also from the side so we can see color patterns that are happening there as well as if it's possible for you to get a shot kind of straight on of the face of the bumblebee. There can be things that, that help us there to see them too. One other trick for taking pictures of bees, of bumblebees is to even just use your, your video feature. Um, if you have that on your phone, um, since bees are flying around quickly, sometimes just taking a, a video if you have a good quality video on your on a you know portable camera or on your phone you can then go in and get a couple of still shots that will have have the different angles on there um so so yeah um i'm i hope that you're excited to to have um spring actually happen here flowers coming out and we'll be able to to look for bumblebees soon um, and you know pollinators. So besides just bumblebees, you know, there's all these other things that are out there pollinating, really um, connecting things, um, but you can help pollinators by making safe spaces for them, by raising awareness, by gathering and sharing data on where you find them. And so hopefully, you know, these connections that we make to, between, um, you know, pollinators do this connecting in the world. So they connect insects to plants, plants to people. And we're, we're hoping that we can also connect people to each other and just make the world more equitable on all these different levels. And um, I can take questions. Perfect, all righty. Yes, I will go back and show my screen. All right, let's see. That was... Amazing. I am so excited for spring to start now. I'm like, I want to get out there and go take pictures of the bumblebees. <laughs> um, all right. Um, 
my slides aren't going forward, but um, Shelby, do we have any questions in the chat for Dr. Evans at all? Yes, we do. Um, feel free guys, this is the time now, put them in either the Q&A or the chat, whatever you're thinking. Um, but we do have one question here to start things off. Um, someone is wondering, how do we encourage bumblebees but discourage uh, wasps and more of a stinger type insects? Right, so so wasps, um, they're actually, wasps are super diverse. They're one of the most diverse groups of, of animals on the planet. Um, and so, so usually when people are wanting to discourage wasps, they're mostly wanting to discourage one or two kinds of wasps. So it's usually yellow jackets um, or, um, or, or you know, others of these social wasps that can have nests that they can end up being um, protective of. So, um, so it's probably more about you know discouraging wasps in places where um, where you may <laughs> run into them. Um, I mean, a pollinator habitat in general. Um, there are you know yellow jackets and and other social wasps will use you know will will they get usually gather nectar from those flowers, but they're getting most of their food. They're mostly carnivores. So most of their food they're getting is from, um, from other, you know, they're going in and getting caterpillars and other insects are actually can be beneficial insects too, because they're getting some of your garden pests. Um, but understandably, um, you know, you don't, you don't want them where you're going to be stepping on the nests. Um, in general, the things that you're going to be doing to encourage um, rusty patch bumblebee and other pollinators um, aren't necessarily going to, to, um, to, to encourage wasps as well. If anything, you're going to be encouraging by making more natural habitat, you're going to make, and you're going to encourage more of, you know, kind of the natural balance in the insect world as well. Um, another question, is there a preference among, you know, I suppose you guys for beehive encouragement or more natural habitat encouragement? Kind of, you know, is there a preference? Is, are they both good? What are your thoughts? Right. So, so um, some people, when they hear about, you know, bees are having problems, they think, oh, I'll get a colony of honeybees. Um, that actually doesn't really help. So the problems that honeybees are having are health problems. And in order for us to, to help honeybees, what we really need is, is um, having fewer numbers of hives that are taken care of really well by the people that are taking care of them. So they're managing them for disease. So we're not having those honeybees having diseases themselves, spreading diseases to other bees. If you wanna help bees and other honeybees, bumblebees, any kind of bees or other pollinators, the best thing to do is to make habitat for them. Um, kind of on that note, are, is there anything that homeowners can do to help best protect the nesting ground of rusty patch bumblebees? Um, is there any like particular time of the year that they need to be paying extra attention to it? Um, rusty patch bumblebees are, are um, unique in bum with the bumblebees we have in Minnesota in that they have a really long nesting season. So the queens come out pretty early. So, um, well, sometimes, <laughs> This time of year, they'd usually already be out, but we're we're kind of a couple weeks behind this year. Um, but pretty as soon as kind of the, the willow trees pop open, as soon as stuff starts flowering, um, those queens will start coming out of hibernation over the next couple weeks from that and make their nests and their nests last through till, till um, end of July, early August. So it's really kind of the whole summer season that they, that they can be nesting. Um, you know, we have had a couple of nests that we've found in recent years that have all been near people's, near or in people's houses um, or in wooded areas. So, um, you know, half of them were, were right, um, right next to, to the houses. Um, and some of them are in wooded areas. So it's really variable where they go. Um, you're not probably not gonna notice them 
even if you have them, because it'll just be a little hole in the ground. And if you don't happen to see the bees going in and out, um, the main thing to do is just having these areas that you do kind of leave alone, um, you know, keeping pesticides off of the habitat in general. Um, and, um, and yeah, leaving some kind of messy corners in your yard so there can be um, spots for, for them to, um, to feel safe. Um, along that line, what are kind of the best plants that you advise people to plant for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee? So Rusty Patch Bumblebees use a lot of different kinds of flowers. There is a list, I can share the, the link for, with you um, and, and you can share with people after, do you have people to, that you can share things to afterwards? If yes, we do. Out. Okay. <laughs> um, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a list of plants um, that are preferred by, by rusty patch bumblebees. Um, their website recently changed, so I need to make sure I can find the right link. Um, but in general, um, you know, they, they love things like bee balm. Um, they, they, you know, they'll, they'll also, um, so, so pretty much any, just about any kind of native flowering plant in the summer, you see them here. There's um, a picture of them here on purple prairie clover. That's another one they like. Um, having, you know, thinking about having things through the season. So having something early on. So, so things like willows or thinking about, you know, trees, things like maple trees, they are also will collect pollen from, you know, in the early spring, having stuff in kind of that mid spring. I like Virginia water leaf is a plant that they really like and, and, and uh, is really easy to grow in a lot of different kinds of habitats. Um, summertime that, um, Hyssop and, and Monarda are great. Late summer, any kind of, of the, any one of the golden rods or um, think stuff like sneezeweed and asters, those are all, all great flowers as well. Um, are there any certain light conditions that these habitats work best in? Uh, full sun, shade, park shade? There are, um, Enough, they're, they're like rusty patch bumblebees will visit enough different kinds of plants that, that usually you can find um, something that will work in any of those light conditions. Nice. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question, if that's okay, and then we'll move on. Um, back to the nesting places. Uh, what are their most common nesting places? Do they like things like mulch or are they more gravitated towards things like rodent holes? You kind of said a little bit, they just like undisturbed areas, um, but are there any more classifications that you could make to that? So the, the main thing is that they like a cavity that's protected and sheltered and has some kind of insulating material in it. So, um, you know, nine times out of 10, that, or, you know, I'm making up that number, but something like that, <laughs> um, that ends up being a, a, a rodent nest. So, you know, wherever, you know, there are, you know, rodents are kind of nesting all over the place, um, that that's kind of the main thing. Um, you know, the undisturbed, you know, but, but we're not gonna, I don't, you know, I don't know how to recommend, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rodent nesting, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. What to, rodents, I don't, I don't think they need any encouraging. They just, they just do it. <laughs> They're just around. Um, but in general, you know, just having those kind of undisturbed areas, having messy kind of corners in your yard, um, you know, piles of sticks, piles of leaves that are kind of left in spots, you know, old compost piles, things like that, um, will, will, will make spots for them that they can then, then find and use. But we are still, yeah, we're still learning a lot. We need to find more rusty patch bumblebee nests uh, and, and describe them more. So I'm hoping that people can keep their eyes out for them. Yeah, well, perfect. Um, well, thank you so much again, Dr. Evans. This was great. You had so much knowledge for our landowners and even us too, so. You have great questions. <laughs> Perfect, Alrighty. Well, we'll just continue on with the presentation then um, and kind of hop into our program for Lawns of Legumes. So we have um, the Lawns of Legumes program here at the Scottsdale Water Conservation District. Um, this program is funded by the state to help landowners create pollinator habitat in residential spaces. 
So it's kind of a combination of um, coaching, planting guides, and kasha funding for these pollinator-friendly plantings. Um, and if you would like more information through um, Bowser on their Lawns Legumes program too, we have um, it just linked right down there. But we have, so what is Lawns Legumes and why is it important? So the establishment of residential pocket plantings to create corridors for pollinators is really our main driver for this. So having multiple different areas where we have um, you know, if we did a rain garden and we had trees and shrubs and just having these multiple different places where the bees are able to forage um, and pollinators in general are able to forage from place to place is extremely important. And as we all know, pollinators are extremely essential in food production and as well as maintaining a healthy ecosystem for birds and other wildlife. So we have a couple different types of plantings that are supported through this program. So first off, we have a pocket planting. Um, this is just simply a small garden of native flowers and grasses. It holds many benefits. Um, you have flowers blooming throughout each season. You could have high diversity of species and you have many possible areas for installation of this. It could be um, many different parts of your yard, in the front or in the back. Um, they're typically planted with live plugs. Um, and then we do have a minimum size of 150 square feet. And the 150 square feet can kind of be broken up on your guys' property if you were thinking of doing, you know, 50 square feet in the by your mailbox. And then you wanted to do 100 square feet in the back. Um, that as long as it equaled that minimum of 150 square feet, you would be good to go. So. Um, next, we have flowering trees and shrubs. Um, this is just planting flowering Minnesota native trees and or shrubs in your yard. Um, some benefits of it is that one flowering tree can provide as much pollinator forage as an entire garden. Um, a large tree can also intercept and retain hundreds of gallons of runoff, help infiltrate the water down. Um, it provides shade and seasonal interest for us, but um, it just, they provide so much pollinator habitat and um, a great food source for them. Then we have our pollinator lawn. Um, we um, have a different, a couple different um, seeds that go into that, um, but this is just converting your traditional lawn into um, include fine fescue, um, Dutch white clover and self heal. A couple benefits of this project would be you can mow less, which everybody in the summer, I know I do, <laughs> um, would appreciate. Um, it promotes deeper root systems to prevent yellowing of the grass and um, increases your soil health. So then we have our pollinator meadow as our last um, eligible project. And this would be expansive areas. We have it capped at the three acres max. And this includes full of, it's full of diversity, um, much like the original prairie that once covered um, this Great Plains area. Some of the benefits include, um, it really just provides the best habitat value as it's very large areas of undisturbed um, land. And then um, just really great for larger lots, high diversity of flowers and grasses, and again, improves soil health. So you may be asking, uh, well, I love doing, I wanna do this, but where, where can I install one of these? So there's many different areas you can, and these are just a couple, um, just a couple areas that are possible, but sometimes boulevards can be a great, great habitat. We could do things in your backyard or your front yard. You could do a pocket planting. Um, also, a rain garden would be considered as a pocket planting to capture and infiltrate um, stormwater, but also provide that pollinator habitat and food source. And we've also had people do lakeshore buffers. Um, this, the roots go so deep in these native plants, it is really great for um, the front of the lakeshores on your property. So we, through Bowser, they created a really awesome document. Um, on the planting for pollinators. This is a great resource for step-by-step -step planting information. It goes through each, through each one of these different um, plantings that I just kind of went over step-by-step um, -step. and Shelby 
Um, she is, I think, oh, she, yep, she just linked it in the chat. So if you would like to take a peek at this or download it, um, it is a very great resource. With that, all right. All right, so now we kind of want to cover um, what we've done in the past. And um, this was in 2020, we got awarded a Lance Leggins grant and we did a demonstration neighborhood. Um, so folks in Scott County here, you may be familiar with the Spring Lake area. We had a total of eight landowners come together um, and really get it, you know, just full of excitement and um, just really into the Lance Legumes mission and what we wanted to accomplish. And they together planted 7,500 square feet of pollinator habitat in their neighborhood. So I'd like to highlight just a couple um, a couple of the things that they did. So this is an example of one of the pocket plantings. Um, these are all in their first year. So we do get the live plugs. They're like one by one inch um, and we plant them in there. So that's why they look small, but they will get um, much bigger year to year. Through the Lance Legumes program, um, there is a requirement of signage to put signage out. Um, so on the right here, you can see the cute sign um, that will be provided for your planting. Here is another planting that was done. Um, this one was a little later in the summer, so it had a couple months of growth, but um, I am completely floored by um, just what it looks like last year or in 2020, so I'm so excited of what it'll look like now. Uh, next, we had um, this planting. This was on the lake shore down to the lake on either side of the steps. And then we had another one on the boulevard. So um, lots of plantings that went in. There was much more, um, but these are just a few of the um, few of the projects we went over. So um, is there any questions on the technical side of it? Or um, Shelby, if there's any questions in the chat, um, Megan will go over next kind of our grant process um, and more of the, the finer details of that. Um, I'm not seeing any immediate questions in the chat. However, I did link a couple of the references that we've been chatting about. And Dr. Evans also provided a link for the Rusty Patch Habitat Guide, so people can check that out as well. Awesome. Um, one question just popped in. Are there other grants other than the Lawns to Legumes program for other things like pollinator habitats? We do have a couple other programs here at the district. Um, if there is more interest on that, for sure, reach out and we can dive into the different programs we offer. Um, but, but yeah, we have, a, we have a couple Native Prairie and Rain Garden um, programs also, so. Perfect. Um, one question asking about local landscapers that we work with. We do have a list of local vendors um, that we will provide landowners if they are interested in having, um, you know, somebody come out and do that. Um, and we also have other resources on um, native plants and on other vendors. So we can for sure provide you with those too. Great. Perfect. That's everything for now. I think that I see here. All right. I just saw a question come in um, asking if we help with assessment and the answer is, is yes. And that's a great segue because that is what I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to try and take control awesome. of the screen and we'll keep going. And I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'll go quick about this last component. Yeah. There we go. So as Hannah mentioned, we do have some funding available through the Lawns Legumes program in the county right now. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go over what that would look like. Um, every year we apply for new grants and we hope that we get them. So for the most part, it's it's fairly stable for, for funding for projects like this, but it is year by year. So we were just awarded a new round of funding for the year um, to create some habitat for the rest of Patch Bumblebee. Um, this new grant that we have is much more open than the previous ones that we've gotten. So um, pretty much anywhere is eligible, honestly. 
um, other than you have to be a resident of Scott County, it's specifically for the Scott County area. Um, but neighborhoods, townhouse associations, um, schools, churches, private land, public land, um, mm -hmm. all of that is eligible with this particular grant. Um, the only thing that I know that is not eligible is the conversion of agricultural land, um, but any rural residential land or urban land um, is, meets the criteria. So in order to receive funding, there are some SWCD criteria and um, yeah, there are some criteria that you need to follow. Um, we have a little handout that we'll be sending out to everyone to kind of that goes over that. Um, but the main thing is that you'll wanna work with us directly to do your project and we'll go over what is eligible um, for the program. So we'll be sending out this little fact sheet afterwards um, with more details on that. Um, and then setting up site visits is probably the best way. Um, just so you know, we do have um, funding for the, for the entire county, but we are trying to prioritize into these areas that we know are the best habitat and priority for rust patch movies. So um, depending on where you live in the county, you might rank out a little bit higher, but the best thing that we want to see is like that demonstration neighborhood that we showed, we want to see plantings that are closely in relationship to each other. So if you can find a neighbor or two that is interested in doing it and you all apply together, you're more likely to get funded that way. We want to have these plantings within good foraging distance for the rest of the patch. So um, just something to consider, but um, it's open to anyone in the county. Um, please just give us a call and we'll try and help you with your application to so make sure that you can get funded. We do have this application timeline just to kind of give you an idea of how the process works. The biggest one is that you'll just want to have a call with us and set up a site visit and we'll help you determine what you'd be eligible for on your property. Um, kind of create a plan with, we'll help you pick out species, we'll help you pick out seed mixes, any types of tree, trees or shrubs, we'll help you locate contractors or um, suppliers for all of that. And then you would sign an application that needs to be approved by our board of supervisors. Once that application is approved um, at one of their monthly meetings, you can go ahead and install your planting and then it is a reimbursement process. So you would get paid for your project once it's complete. So there's a lot more details in that timeline um, here, but again, that's gonna be going on that fact sheet that we'll send out to everyone, um, but that's kind of the quick overview of it. And then just a quick um, note about the types of plants and seeds that are eligible for the program. Everything needs to be native to Minnesota and sourced from a local nursery that's neonicotinoid free. We don't wanna have any type of pesticides in our plants because we're trying to encourage pollinators. Um, another big thing to keep in mind is we don't allow cultivars. Cultivars rarely provide good pollinator habitat. So anything that's growing in these plantings, um, the goal is to provide food and foraging for our rusty patch bumblebee and other pollinators. We do have a local plant supplier list that we can share with everyone of, um, of approved nurseries that carry these types of plants and species. And then just one little quick plug, we actually are in the middle of our tree sale right now that the SWC holds every year. We sell native trees, shrubs, plants, and seed mixes. Um, you can check out our website. I think Shelby just linked it down below. Um, we do have our pickup day coming up on April 29th, where we'll have a bunch of extra species available for pickup that day too, that you can purchase right there and then. And then our plant sale will start in May and we have pre-made kits of native plants that are just designed for each type of soil and sunlight condition. Um, so that's a great resource um, if you're looking to get some local native plants. And we um, are also planning on having custom kits made this year specifically for these types of planting. So you can just determine you've got a sunny spot. Here's a kit that will be perfect for um, the rusty patch bumblebee and pollinators. And you can order directly from us for this program. So I went through, I think everything there. Are there any questions on our cost share or grant program? Yes, there's one right off the bat. It's a great question. Um, Someone's wondering, can you still apply for a grant even if you're not exactly sure what your project's going to look like yet? Yes, absolutely. And we don't expect anyone to know right off the bat what you want to do in your property. That's what our site visits are for. We'll come out there um, and give you some recommendations. And then you would apply for the grant application after that site visit when we've talked about um, the types of practices and um, what you might be eligible for. So the application would come after the site visit. And a couple of folks are wondering the best way to contact us. Yep, and I can switch to that next slide. That probably is the best way. We have all of our contact information listed here. So you can call our general office um, 
or you can reach out to any of us directly. Um, either way is fine, or you can email us, or email is listed below, and I believe that we'll send out our contact information after this as well. Yes, we will be. Um, everyone who registered for this webinar is going to be getting an email from me with kind of an overview of the information that was talked about today, um, as well as a survey to kind of let us know how we're doing with these programs, how we can improve. And within that survey, there's also going to be kind of a contact slip for folks to fill out if they want a site visit from us. So you can fill out your name, your phone number there, and we'll reach out to you and we'll get that site visit scheduled. Perfect. Um, I did just see a question come through in the Q&A. Um, yeah. Someone's asking, can you have some plants that are not necessarily native to Minnesota, um, like herbs interspersed into the area? And the answer is yes, of course. You can have all kinds of different um, plantings within your property. Um, but for the program for reimbursement, that it would just need to be things that are native and that are approved by us. So we're not saying that you have to convert your whole property to only native species, um, but just know that for the reimbursement part of the program and what, what's eligible for funding, it needs to follow our list and our criteria. And then I just saw someone ask what the typical, typical cost sharing percentage is. And I, I knew someone was gonna ask that. Um, we can't share exactly what our, our cost share is gonna be right now because our board hasn't approved it. Um, so hopefully within the next week, their, their meeting is next Thursday. So once that is approved, I can officially let you know what our rate is, um, but it's typically somewhere between 50 to 75% of the cost of a project is reimbursed. And we're trying something new this year and we just have to wait for approval um, before we can share that. So. I know that's a really important factor. Um, another thing to also note for many of these practices, typically the cost share is just for um, plants, planting materials, site preparation. It does not normally cover the cost of like landscapers or contractor fees. So it's really just for the materials. Um, many of the projects are really small and simple and a lot of landowners just end up doing them on their own kind of DIY type of project. Um, but just so you know that there is a limitation and a maximum of what we can fund for each project and what can be funded. And that'll all be kind of spelled out in our little fact sheet that we'll be sharing um, once it's ready. Anything else? Um, we did have a question and it's a good one. Someone's wondering if the Eagle Creek neighborhood is in the priority area. Can you go back to that map, yeah. Megan? Yeah, I guess I don't know where the Eagle Creek neighborhood is. Um, the good news for our county is that our entire county is within priority one, two, or three. So if you live in Scott County, you're definitely in the top three priorities in the state. Many counties aren't even, don't have any of these priorities in them. Um, if Eagle Creek is like, if that's up kind of like Shakopee area, is that the area that um, they're thinking? Then yes, it would be in priority one if that's the area that I'm thinking of. Um, but don't, I don't want people to worry too much about what priority you're in. I just want people to be aware that we are going to try and focus projects in some of these areas. But like I said, um, yes, Shakopee and Savage. So yes, you're in priority one in Shakopee and Savage. Um, but just know that the funding is until it runs out. And so we might be able to fund all the projects. And if we have to be selective, then this is kind of how we will, um, determine that. So. Um, don't get too hung up on the priority areas, but like I said, if you have neighbors that are willing to do the projects too, along with you, that will really boost your application and, and chance of getting approved. So, yep. Any okay. other questions? That's oh, all that I see. <laughs> right I know, time. perfect timing. <laughs> um, I think that's everything that we have here right now. Um, again, folks should be seeing that email with the survey and contact and additional information coming to them later this afternoon. Um, if there are any other questions that people come up with, feel free to contact us from our information on that one slide. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you guys for your information. Yep. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day, everyone.